During the past four centuries, Americans have had a love of barns. So let's hop in a time machine to see how barns have changed over the years in Carroll County, Maryland. Our first stop is around 1794 to visit the Hoff Barn, located at the Carroll County Farm Museum, where we'll hear from Bob Shirley to learn all about this fascinating barn. Okay, we're out here at the Carroll County Farm Museum at the Hoff Log Barn. Now this is a barn that was built when George Washington was president. So talking about something that's got a lot of age to it. And of course, it's built with wood. Now, if you really want to see it up close, you can come out to the farm museum. What did farmers do back then? We wanted to build a barn. Well, the first thing you had to do was go out in the woods and cut down trees. And then you would drag those logs back to wherever you were going to build the barn oh, with it. Nowadays, of course, you'd use a bulldozer or a big green and yellow tractor, maybe. But back in those days, what did you, you had a pair of horses or a yoke of oxen. So you'd drag it back here and uh, however many logs you needed and you would start to build. And uh, you used a variety of hand tools because there wasn't very much in the way of machinery. And we always talk, what did they have for power. People, horses, oxen. No kind of motors, no kind of engines. They had to figure out how to do things that way. And they did. Um, they, one of the things that was, oh, I don't want to say rare, but hard to find and expensive would be metal things, nails. Nails had to be made by a blacksmith, handmade each nail. So when they went to build a barn, they used as few nails as possible. And we do say that this barn was built without nails, which is almost true. Um, but they had to use s skills in woodworking to get it to work. And of course they used, instead of, uh, of that, they would use things like wooden pegs, to hold things together. Um, they, inside the barn, and we'll go in here in a minute, uh, you can see that what they did was they notched the logs and stacked them like this. No nails and nothing else either to hold them up on because they didn't have the glues and duct tape and that kind of stuff back in those days. Um, and so they had to be precise and how they made those notches. Because once you put one of these great big logs up there, you didn't want to take it back down because it was too much work. Something to use a sawmill, that was a little tougher because again, what you need now, if you were near water, a good sized stream, perhaps there was a water wheel driven sawmill. But in lots of cases, to saw those timbers, dig a hole in the ground, a person would stand down in that pit. The log would be up over top of that pit and somebody else would be standing on the log. And of course, the person in the bottom had one end of the saw and the person on the top had the other end of the saw. And they saw it. And ah, 20 minutes later, they'd had it sawed. The whole log would have been sawed through or however long it took. Now, but if you ever get offered a job at a place like that, make sure you're not the person in the pit because they get all the sawdust on them. Um, and you will see some stuff in here sawed down. The, these doors are not original. We had somebody make them because the original doors were long gone. Okay, now we're looking at these doors. And again, remember the doors are not original, but they are made as the original doors were made. And one of the things we talked earlier about was metal, rare, expensive. Had, everything had to be made by a blacksmith. So hinges, they didn't use metal hinges. They, on the, on the top and bottom of this log, that's the edge of the door, they, they cut 
a round piece, looks like a soup can from the log. And uh, so then they'd make a hole in the floor, stick the, that hole in there, put it up here and put another piece of wood across it to hold it in place. So really no hinges, just again, the ingenious use of wood to get that accomplished. And uh, one of the things that some of us in this day and age marvel about that, how did they ever figure out how to do those things? Uh, but when we, when we go inside, we'll see that many of the logs and beams in here are original from the 1790s. Okay, now, we talked about how these logs were put together. And remember we said, no nails. If you'll see here, they notched the logs. Here, here, and of course, over here. So we're stacking the logs up. Oh, kind of like Lincoln logs, if you're familiar with that old toy. Um, and of course, there's nothing holding them in place except the notches and gravity, the weight of the logs. Now, does that mean that if there's nothing else holding them together, are they going to stay there? Well, I can lean on them and they're not going to fall over. And I guarantee you, if a hurricane would come through here, it might blow the roof off, it might blow the siding off. They're going to be there. Nothing's going to move them. They're there for a couple hundred more years without any trouble. Um, we talked about here, uh, originally here in the barn, there, there wasn't a hole here. That, that was done by somebody else that was using it at some point to put something in and out there. Uh, because this was originally was logs all the way to the top. Uh, so it was like a, a, a really a pen of logs on both sides of the barn. And uh, in, the, in there, they would have put hay, probably hay on one side, and probably grain, mostly wheat, I would think, on the other side. Now, of course, the wheat had been cut by using a, a cradle by hand and then put it into bundles and wrapped with straw and tied with straw. And that's what would be in there. And it would and uh, it would stay in there until it got good and dry. And then later on in the year, they would uh, uh, thrash the grain out. We had a dendrochronologist. That's a big word for some guy who knew something about wood and timber. Uh, look at him. And he said that some of these trees, when they were cut down, and they were cut down somewhere around 1790, were already 250 years old. So we got a lot, a lot of years in our logs here. And wood is such a wonderful thing to use to build with that of course, they're gonna be there for a long time yet. Now these logs are mostly oak. Uh, if we had been in upper part of Baltimore County, they would have been chestnut, but we didn't have a lot of chestnut trees in Carroll County. So they used oak. Um, it lasts, it's sturdy, it's strong. Now, one of the things here, Edwin D. Huff, August 25, 1920, put that in a log. Now, we don't know why he did that, but I have an idea. And my idea is that he would, they were unloading hay and the wagon had gone back out to get another load. He was in the barn waiting for the next wagon and he was bored. So this might've been what he did. That anybody else got any ideas? That's fine. Because we don't know and we never will really know. Okay. Now, this platform that we see up here, uh, was originally there. One of the, remember now, our sides were logs all the way to the top. There weren't these holes in them uh, that were done at a later time in, in history. But uh, what you did, what you needed that for was uh, 
You bring your load of hay, a pair of horses, bring a wagon load of hay, pull it in here on the barn floor. Somebody stands on the load of hay with a pitchfork, throws the hay up on that platform. There's somebody up on the platform. And with a pitchfork, they throw it over that top log into that mound. Uh, so that was how in the, originally they would get things done way up high. And of course, took people, of course, somebody would be in the mound also spreading the hay around or the grain or whatever you were throwing up in there uh, to see that it stayed level and, and uh, packed nicely. But, uh, it's, it, it was not a, not a particularly, none of this work was particularly easy. It all took a fair amount of muscle and work. And, hey, you know what? What did, what did kids do on a farm for fun back in the 1790s? Farm work. Come on, they just worked. There wasn't a lot of playtime. When you got, to be, you got to be old enough to handle a fork, I'm sure seven, eight-year-olds were probably doing some of this work. We look at, the, at some of these pieces up above here, and we talk about how they did saw things, and you can see that that uh, brace up there is sawed rather than hand-hewn. But... They put those things together down here on the ground and saw that each piece fit. And of course, much of that is put together with wooden pegs uh, because you didn't, if it didn't fit, you wanted to correct it down here. You didn't want to have to take something down from when it was up high. And again, they knew just exactly how much bracing uh, would work to hold things in place and to add a little support uh, to the barn. Uh, the barn, as you, look at, as you look at it from there too, you can see the, the siding doesn't always fit close together. A little bit of air can come through there. And uh, that helped uh, with drying crops that were in the barn, whether we did talk, uh, we, we'll talk about that at another time, but tobacco, uh, grain, hay, uh, whatever they had in here, they wanted to be sure it got plenty of air so it would uh, dry and keep. Okay. Now, we talked about sawing down the trees. What did we, they use? They used a two-man saw. And that saw, obviously, a person with each handle and a person with the saw, you pull. And then the person on the other side pulls you. Don't push because then the saw buckles. And it, uh, if the saw is sharp, you can cut down a tree in a fair amount of time. It's certainly not like the power equipment you use today and uh, required a little bit of muscle that you might not have needed in today's work for those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, we talked about these logs. These are 38 feet long. But logs up in the top of the barn are 50 feet long. You're going to have to wiggle things here to see. And it's, it's not real easy to see, but look at the log from end to end. Those, each log up there was a single tree. Uh, they did not splice logs together. But again, remember now those trees were 250 or so years old when they were cut down. And, uh, and of course, there have been very, very few people in this, in the, this part of the Carroll County area back in the 1790s. So those trees have, uh, have not been harvested. And, uh, but it does take a, a long, awfully now. They, you know, they probably weigh more than a ton, like more than probably what your family car weighs. That made it kind of hard to get up there. And usually when we ask the question, uh, how'd they get them up there? Somebody says you carried them up a ladder. Well, carrying your automobile up a ladder would be a little hard. They did have to rig up a series of pulleys and ropes and use again 
probably a pair of horses uh, to pull those logs up high to put them up there. Uh, oxen, the horses have a, a little steadier in their pull. Oxen would have gone much slower and uh, could have used them, but they probably used horses. Uh, but all of that that we see, and of course, as we said, originally there were no holes in these two mouths. Some people call them pens, uh, but us old farmers call them mouths. Uh, on each side, uh, they were cut in there at some other point. Um, if we're going to do uh, put hay or grain in there, it had to go in all the way over the top. Uh, and of course, to get in there, you just climb right up the side here, over the top, and climb down the other side using these logs for uh, steps. You didn't have a, a ladder as such. Uh, roof on here is uh, cedar shingles. And uh, shingles were very one of the two things that were used a great deal for roofing back in that era. The other thing, of course, would have been a thatched roof, thatched with rye straw. And of course, you used, when you thatched a roof, you used rye straw uh, because uh, insects don't like rye straw. Rye straw, so if you walked in the barn or in the house where there was, uh, we had a thatched roof and it was with rye straw, you wouldn't have too many bugs falling down on you. Uh, but again, they did have to use some nails when they put the, put the shingles on. And again, those, you had to know a neighborhood blacksmith because, of course, you couldn't travel too far away. You didn't get things from any great distance in those days uh, because transportation was limited to uh, horse and wagon uh, as far as getting stuff hauled somewhere. Uh, the best part about these old logs that we love is the fact that they got this tremendous age to them, and you can see that uh, originally when they smoothed, they smoothed two sides of the log, this side and the other side, and left the tops and bottoms the same, and there's still some old bark left on those logs, but most of the bark has dried and fallen off in that time. Now, they had to smooth the sides of these logs, they used a variety of tools that are here. One of the important ones is the ads. And one of the things that I really like, and you'll probably you'll get a close-up of this picture, is the fact that when this fellow used the ads to take off a little bit of bark, he kept his foot turned up so that if the ads slipped, it hit the sole of his shoe and not his leg. Uh, but this is what... and. We had a, uh, uh, some people that, uh, uh, craft right especially, that know what they're doing on this kind of stuff. And they say that they could tell which logs uh, had been smoothed by the master builder and which ones by the apprentice. And I'm just guessing here, because I don't really know, but this one is beautifully smooth and this one's rough. And so I imagine that, I'm just imagining that's the one that was done by the master builder while the beginners, the apprentices, were doing the other ones and learning how to get them as smooth as these guys got them. Um, wood is a, and of course we use a great deal of wood today in construction uh, because it is, it lasts, it's easy to work with. Uh, Medium light in weight anyway, as far as we're talking about, certainly lighter in weight than concrete or, or steel or something like that. Uh, so we, we use a lot of wood in construction. Now let's take a closer look at the process of turning the wooden logs into barn beams, beginning with the cross-cut saw that Mr. Bob mentioned. To use this saw, two men pull it back and forth through the tree. This makes a flat cut on each end of the log. When they cut, the metal saw makes a musical sound. Next, they carry the logs 
using tongs that act like scissors. Two men drag the log with the tongs from the woods, usually downhill to the building site. Next, the builder pins the logs down with a log dog at each end to keep the log steady while shaping it with other tools. He hammers it in place with a mallet and removes the log dog with a crowbar. Next, he uses a barking spud to push the flat side of the spud against the bark to pry it away from the wood. Next comes the draw knife. The builder uses the long flat draw knife blade towards himself to peel away more bark and some wood. This cleans the log before he scribes the chalk line. The chalk line is used with a powdered string done with charcoal to mark straight lines on the log. The chalk line is run from marks at each end and snapped to make one line down the length of the log. The line shows how much wood to remove. Next, he uses the plumb bob to dangle it to make a, from the string to make a straight line to square up the log and both ends are marked. Next, he uses the felling axe to bevel the sides. The builder uses it to notch the log down to the chalk line. The next tool used is a hewing axe or hatchet, which has one flat side. To remove the wood between the notches, the builder strikes with the flat side from one notch to the other. This is the first step to plane the log flat on one side. The axe is larger than the hatchet. The next tool used is an adze, which is used by holding the tool near the feet and swinging to chip away more of the surface. One foot is used to stop the swing of the adze from hitting the builder's leg. The final tool used is a broad axe. After he rotates the log slightly, the builder swings the broad, flat blade against the log to refine the smooth surface. The handle is curved away from the blade. There are left and right-handed broad axes to work in both directions. Now that we've seen the whole process, let's take a closer look at some more things in the barn. Besides the log beams, other milled lumber was used to make parts of this barn, including the wooden siding and the roof. As Mr. Bob mentioned, nails and metal parts were very expensive, so the other internal structures were held together using various types of framing joints, such as these, and wooden pegs were often used to hold them securely in place. So what was the top part of the barn used for? It was used to store crops, such as hay and grain for the farmer's animals, or to sell if there were leftovers, as well as fiber to make cloth goods for the family and also to sell if there were any leftovers. Stepping outside, we can get an idea of the size of the barn by comparing it to Mr. Bob, who can be seen on the left. While the upper half of the barn was for crops, the lower half housed animals keeping them warm in the winter and cool in the summer due to the thick stone walls and the fact that it was partially underground. Moving forward into the next century, we'll stop at the Alms Barn, built between 1852 and 1853. This barn is original to the Farm Museum property and is much larger than the Hoff Barn. Let's take a look at some of the differences in the 60 years after the Hoff Barn was built. The obvious difference that you will notice first is that the barn has been painted red. Hundreds of years ago, many farmers would seal their barns with linseed oil, which is an orange-colored oil derived from the seeds of the flax plant. To this oil, they would add a variety of things, such as milk or lime, but often ferrous oxide or rust. Rust was plentiful on farms, and because it killed fungi and mosses that might grow on barns, it was very effective as a sealant, and it turned the mixture red in color. When paint became more available, many people still chose to paint their barns red in honor of tradition. You will also notice that the vents are now painted white and are a bit more decorative, and there are also many more of them in addition to three cupula, cupulas on top of the roof. These were used to provide light in the barn, but more importantly, to allow air to circulate to help dry the crops. Moisture in crops can lead to mold spoiling grain and moisture causing hay to heat up and spontaneously combust, which was a common cause of barn fires. Inside, the first thing we notice is that there are no longer log beams. In their place are milled timbers joined with various joints and held in place with wooden pins. Another thing that we notice in this barn is the hay fork 
track and trolley in the top ridge of the barn. This would have been added after the barn was built because these were not invented until the 1860s and earlier models ran on wooden tracks. Steel rails replaced wooden beams around 1890 and the hay grapple seen here was one of the later types capable of grabbing about one third of a wagon's hay. These hay trolleys allowed hay to be moved with much more ease and also allowed farmers to pile more hay in their barn, allowing them to store more for the winter. Another difference that you will notice is that there are now ladders built into the timbers to allow easy access to the higher areas of the barn. The Hoff log barn did not have ladders. Farmers had to climb using the spaces between the logs, which was much more difficult. This barn also has separate rooms for things such as granaries, which were rooms used to store grains. Looking at the overall outside appearance of the barn, in contrast to the Hoff barn, this barn has several glass windows in its upper and lower levels. Moving on to the lower level of the barn, where the animals were housed, we again see thick stone walls over two feet thick, which were needed to support the heavy barn above. This barn was also built into a bank and is partially underground, so that fact, plus the thick stone walls, kept the lower barn warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Built into the stone in various places are pegs used to hang things, such as harnesses. While the lower floor has been modernized with concrete, it is possible that the support beams may have been held in place, reinforced with a form of cement to stabilize them. These support beams held the floor beams from above in place. Since this barn is much larger, it used multiple log beams overlapping and resting on central timbers for support. While on our stop at the Farm Museum, let's look at another barn, which was not original to the property. Here we see the much smaller reception barn. There are no records on when this barn was built, but we can see that it had two small plain cupolas and only a few small vents, which are slightly fancier than the Alms barn. It has the traditional bank barn overhang, thick stone walls, and three Dutch doors for animal stalls, which allow the bottom half to be closed to contain the animals and the top half to remain open to let in light and fresh air. Moving on to a newer barn, we'll head out to River Valley Ranch to see their bank barn, which was built around 1876 from lumber milled at a nearby sawmill. This barn is very large, as you can see by the comparison to the woman in front of it. It has many large vents, which are not very fancy, but no cupolas, which may have possibly been removed if, when the roof was replaced. It has two large sets of sliding doors, so let's grab these recycled horseshoe door handles and head inside. The top of this barn is very unique in that it has been repurposed into an indoor paintball course, complete with scoreboard for campers and private rentals. Not only does their barn have gaps between the boards, but you can see very tall vents, both of which let in lots of light and more importantly, fresh air to help cure the hay originally stored inside the barn. As we look up, we can see the hay trolley system in the barn peak, right next to the modern lighting. Since this was a steel track system, it was added after the barn was built, but it may have replaced a wooden track system because that type did exist when this barn was new. This barn was built with mortise and tenon joints, which were secured with wooden pegs, and it has large doors that would allow equipment to enter and a smaller inset door to allow people to enter. Here we can see the old floor walked upon by many generations of farmers and the granary used to store grain. Moving back outside, we see the side of the barn with a quilt block called the Tree of Life from the Carroll County Barn Quilt Trail, which you can follow by driving around the county to view the various barns listed on this trail. A copy is available from the Carroll County Tourism website or from picking up a trail guide at various locations around the county. From the front of the barn, we see a small building attached to the left side, which may have been a milk house containing a milk tank, as this barn was once used for dairy farming. The left side with the windows may have been the milking parlor to allow for plenty of light in the milking area. On the far right hand side, we see an open area possibly used for storing farm equipment. In the middle, we see three Dutch doors which would have been used for animal stalls. Now the only animal inhabitants are barn swallows, whose nests are often seen in the bottom of bank barns. 
The remainder of the lower barn is now only used for storage. When we look up, we can see that the ceiling beams are made from logs, many of which still have their bark on them. This barn is so large that the logs overlap on the support beams. It was built tough and has withstood the test of time. Moving on to the next century, we see the Fogel Barn, which was built in 1914 and has been in this farm family for four generations since back in the 1920s. This barn is between the size of the Hoff and River Valley Ranch barns and is the only one of our barns with an attached silo for animal feed remaining. This barn has many vents on all sides and is the only barn with very fancy vents, which may have indicated that the original owners were wealthy enough to afford this fancy style. As we step inside, we can see that barns were still put together with mortise and tenon joints, but using wooden pegs to stabilize them, and they still had ladders to climb high into the haylofts. By the time this barn was built, hay balers had been invented, but the modern self-tie balers were not invented until the 1930s, so it's possible that hay was still loosely stored in this barn for quite some time before being stored in bales. Whether loose or baled, hay would be dropped through trap doors in the floor from above down to the animals below. To store grain for the animals, this barn had a granary with separate bins for various grains, which are still in use today. Painted on the granary wall is the date the barn was built with initials likely belonging to the builder or farm owner at the time of building. To maximize storage space, this barn was built with a loft, still in use today, which is accessible by ladder. Taking a look at the lower level, we see two distinct sides. The left side originally contained an old dairy milking parlor, with the stanchions still remaining, and a stall for cows. The walls are the original stone and were whitewashed with a lime mixture to give them a cleaner appearance and brighten the lower barn. The right side of the barn originally housed horses used to work on the farm, but once tractors appeared, the right side was converted into a modern milking parlor in the 1940s, complete with 16 stanchions for milking cows. The attached building housed the milk house, which contained the milk holding tank and pumping equipment. This was used until 1994 when the farm stopped milking. Milking parlor contained the lower entrance to the silo, where feed was removed to be fed to the cows. Going back outside, we see on the roof of the barn a weather vane to the right and lightning rods along the ridge, used to deflect lightning strikes down to the ground to decrease damages in the event of a, a thunderstorm. As we have now seen, not much has changed in the appearance of barns over three centuries, but we'll now move into the 21st century to see the many changes in, that happened in the last 100 years. This barn was built in 2005 and looks vastly different from the other ones we've seen during the previous centuries. Although some things are still similar, such as overhangs to shelter animals, Dutch doors, large doors providing access for equipment, grain storage room, and stalls for animals. This modern barn now contains lots of metal, which is in contrast to the previous centuries. Metal can be seen in such things as metal stall grates, metal hinges, bolts, and flashings, as well as modern latches and door handles and drain grates. Now, to reach the loft above, the farmer can climb steps to the storage areas. While old barns may have contained limited windows to provide light, which were not as plentiful as barns today, nor were they covered with metal grates to protect them from being broken. The modern farmer is now able to have light 24 hours a day, thanks to modern light bulbs and switches. While modern barns are still built with large timbers, they now contain tongue and groove lumber, many nails, sheets of plywood, and the ultimate difference may be a plush, luxurious tack room. From the 1700s to the 1800s to the 1900s to the 2000s, some things may have changed, 
But the thing that remains is that barns should always be treasured and maintained to keep that spirit of farms alive. While some old barns are still used for holding animals, grain, and equipment, others have been repurposed for education, receptions, paintball, or just plain storage. Either way, it is important to maintain these treasures for the generations to come. To learn more about keeping these treasures alive, watch the upcoming June CCPO video, Restoration of an Old Barn, to follow the rebirth of an, this old log barn, which was built from 1790 to 1840 and has been lovingly restored to its former glory. You will be surprised to see how beautiful it turns out at the end of its transformation.